For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will also be. He's given us really helpful biblical principles to honor God in this world. Money, money is not the means. Money does not give you meaning. There's no significant value. There's no difference in value of worth of a person based on their income. There's no. God does not view you in terms of how much money you make. Thank you, Craig. We are in a middle of a series entitled The Search. And if you're a guest with us, we're about halfway through the series. And it's on the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is found in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. It's nearby Proverbs and Song of Solomon. And so Ecclesiastes is the book that we are in today. Chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. We have some Bibles. I believe the text will be on the screen as well. And the title of the series is The Search. Why? Because all of us go through life looking and searching for what? For meaning and purpose. And just when you feel like you have it, you reach out to grab it, and it's like a mist. It's like a vapor. It's here today. You think you can grab hold of it, and then as soon as you grab hold of it, it's, it's gone, right? We've all experienced that in different ways and different things, different subjects of our life. The search. And the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes writes about all the different things, and we've gone through a number of them in the first few chapters. Today we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse, verse 1. And he's going to talk about what does it look like to come to the house of the Lord. Guard your steps. Begins with a caution in verse 1. Guard your steps. Caution. Warning. When you come to the house of the Lord, when you come to worship, there's some steps to be mindful of. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. There was a sacrifice that was, that was common in the Old Testament, and it was a zeba. A zeba was a type of offering that would, you would bring it, and it would be a slaughter of a beast. And then later on, you would eat the sacrifice that you would bring. You could see how very easily it would become the beginning of the service. My walk up to the altar is worship. And quickly it becomes pleasure. I'm going to take the sacrifice that I have offered for God and I'm, eventually I'm going to throw a party over that sacrifice. That's what was happening. And in fact, they weren't just bringing a beast and then eating that beast, using it as a sacrifice, and then eating the meat. They weren't even bringing their best. So they, over time, began to bring the sheep that had some blemishes. So the instruction that God gave the people when they brought their sacrifice, they were to bring the very best, the very best from their herd, from the backyard, from their from the cattle, they were to bring the very best, the one without blemish, the one that didn't walk with a limp, the one that didn't have any illnesses. And what they began doing is they began to not bring their best. And it became a sacrifice of fools. Be not rash with your mouth, not let your heart be hasty as utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. We read and study Ecclesiastes in light of the New Testament, in light of all that Jesus has to come and say. And we've been making a beeline in each chapter of Ecclesiastes to Jesus, which is just good. Anytime you study a passage anywhere in the Bible, make a beeline to Jesus. Because every word and every verse and every phrase points to Jesus. Every word of the Bible whispers his name. 
you cannot read scripture without reading it in light of Jesus. And so we look at, we look at this passage. The first couple of verses talk about don't come half-hearted. Don't come half-hearted to worship. Now, I think about many, many times I've come half-hearted to worship. Be honest with you, there are days I don't feel like worshiping. And if, if that's you this morning, it's okay. I don't feel like worshiping. Our worship's not based on our feelings. I can sing a lyric to a song, some of the songs we sang this morning, and not feel like it. But I'm de- what am I doing? I'm declaring the truth of that song. And as I do that, by God's grace, you know what begins to turn? My feelings and emotions. And I leave. At the end of the song, I, I have more confidence and I have more blessed assurance in my life, in the truth of, of my life. Half-hearted. Now, the good news for all of us who might be here half-hearted, again, we read this text in light of Jesus. The good news is, God has never entered into receiving our worship half-hearted. God has never done anything for you half-hearted. If you're here today, I want you to know that you receive 100% of the love that God has for you. He he hasn't done anything in your life throughout this course of your life half-hearted for you. He has been all in for you. In every, every area of your life, God has been all in for you. Jesus, even going to the cross, we just remembered this moment, a significant moment. What we do, we remember the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. Jesus didn't say to Kyle, Kyle, I've got, I'm going to cover half your sins. I'm going to cover all your past, but as far as today and tomorrow, you're on your own. Jesus said, I'm, t- I'm covering all of them. One sacrifice once for all, Hebrew says, from now for the rest of my life. All my sins are covered. And all your sins, you receive it today by grace and mercy. All your sins are forgiven because of the work of Jesus. My friends, Jesus went all in for you. When we come to the house of God for worship, the opportunity we have is to be all in. At Boulder Mountain, we make disciples. And I get sometimes the question, well, what's really a disciple? Here's our definition. A disciple of Jesus at Boulder Mountain is an all-in follower of Jesus. All in. And we're all on that journey. We're all making steps to be all in. My my prayer is that next week I'm going to be a little farther along than I am this week. There's plenty of grace for this whole room, no matter where you're at, that we we would take a step closer to being a fully devoted disciple of Jesus, an all in follower of Jesus. What does that look like in our worship? means worship begins before worship begins. Before the worship service begins, we've already begun preparing for worship. It means let your yes be yes, your no be no. You agree to something, you commit to something, that's a part of your worship all throughout the week. That's worship. The Bible tells us everything that you do is, can be worship. Because we do not work for man, but ultimately everything we do, we work for God. Whether you eat or drink, that coffee in your hand right now, you can sip that coffee, amen, for the glory of God today. Whatever you do, the Bible says, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Your entire life is worship. It is more than just singing a song. It includes singing a song. Make no mistake. What happens here is something special. It's something mysterious. It's, it, we trust God that what he is doing in this place as we sing, there is encouragement being given. God is hearing our worship. He's, he's hearing it rise to heaven. Worship is an important part. Let us not forsake. Let's not forget. Let's not ignore gathering together for worship. I encourage you to do that. In summer, there's going to be a lot of things going on this summer. And if you're out of town, you can watch online, but if you're here in the area, join us. Be here. Come early, stay late, because worship also includes all the conversations that happen before service and after service. And Take a moment to pray for one another in the room, outside the room, on the patio. Go to lunch with each other. That's all worship. Guard your steps when you come to the house of God. Let's not show up flippantly. Verse 4, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying for it. 
For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not pay before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. If you're a guest with us today, we've been talking a lot about vanity, meaninglessness, all this work and all this toil. It's going to all end the same no matter what you do day in, day out. Unless, unless we find meaning and purpose and not a what but a who. And that who is Jesus Christ. Jesus gives your life meaning and purpose. Jesus, Jesus turns everything that is vanity under the sun and gives us meaning and purpose that will impact, listen, for eternity. For eternity. The choices that you, that you make this week will matter for eternity. If you make those decisions in light of your relationship with Christ. Then he makes a turn in this passage of chapter 5. He makes the turn. Verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. Say, hey, no matter where you look, there's going to be oppression. There's going to be injustice. Any corner of the world that you go to today, you will see it. You'll see it in our community. Do not be amazed at the manner, for the high official is wretched by the higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way a king committed to cultivated fields. He's, he's saying, Solomon, if it's Solomon, if it's person writing in the persona of Solomon, he's like, hey, I've been there. I was the owner of all the fields and the, the workers, so I know that money doesn't always trickle down to everyone, that there are those who are oppressed. There are those who go without. There are those who toil and they still have needs that go unmet. In verse 10, again, that he takes a turn here. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. We can all testify and tell stories of pursuing the almighty dollar. And this term here, money, in Ecclesiastes 5, mammon. Jesus picks up this phrase. It's more than just the currency he's talking about. He's talking about the greed, pursuing wealth, this drive within us that we all have. We want more. We, we don't have enough. We want, we want a raise. We want more. We want a bigger house. We want a bigger car. We want a nicer car. We want a newer car. We want, he's talking about not just the currency. He's talking about the, the drive for the, and the pursuit of wealth including in greed, is what the author, the preacher is talking about here in Ecclesiastes. At the end of the day, he's saying wealth, as we all know, will not satisfy. When goods increase, they increase to eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Let me break it down for you here, what Solomon is saying. The author, the preacher saying, listen, if you own a boat, your problems of life will increase. You now need a trailer to pull the boat. You now need gas, not just for the truck to pull the trailer, but for the boat as well. You now need a permit for that boat. You now need to drive somewhere where there's water to use the boat. You now have to take time off to use the boat. The boat's going to break down. You now need a repair shop to fix your boat. He's saying that thousands of years ago, the more stuff you have, the more problems you are going to have. If you don't have a boat, you're going to sleep better. <laughs> right? Work hard, don't own a boat. You know what's better than owning a boat? Having a friend who owns a boat. <laughs> have a friend who owns the boat because they're going to feel guilty if that boat's not being used, so they're going to let you use their boat. It's the same with the cabin up north, right? Now I got to go up and I got to, you know, winterize the cabin. We have to drive up there. I don't want to go, but we own this cabin. We invested in this cabin, so now we have to go use this cabin. What is it for you? What have you purchased, bought, thought your life's going to be better when you got it, and you realized it isn't? In fact, my life just got a whole lot more complicated 
Maybe for you today, you just need to hear, it's okay. Life's better if you don't own a boat. You don't have a cabin. For the very first time in our life, we now are pool owners. And now I've got to figure out how to run a pool and clean a pool. And we have to use the pool. We feel guilty having a pool and don't use it. So now, all right, I had to find a pool guy to help me with, with some of the stuff that I can't figure out. There are things in our life that we think are going to fulfill us and we chase after them and that just creates more problems. I've got to stay up later to address the things that I now own and I have to get up earlier to, to use them. He's saying this thousands of years ago. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So as I have more product, now I need more laborers and I have to feed those laborers and I have to pay those laborers. God answered my prayer and he gave me more work, but now I have more expenses. There's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. He's the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And he has come from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Listen, what is he saying is all of us entered the world naked without a penny to our name. All of us will leave this world without a penny to our name. You, you will not take a penny with you. You take your last breath, you're not taking it with you, right? There's no U-Haul on the back of a Hertz. You, and that day is approaching some of us faster than we, we even know. And yet we're investing in stuff of this world that will not satisfy Jesus speaks more about money than any other topic. Jesus speaks more about money than sin. Jesus speaks more about money than heaven. Jesus speaks more about money than hell. Jesus speaks more about money than loving your neighbor. Those are all really, really important topics. Why in the world would Jesus spend so much time talking about money? What was true thousands of years ago is still true to this day. When we enter the house of worship, God desires our heart. And part of our heart, being all in with Jesus, is our wallet is shortly after that. Our wallet and our heart are connected. It's really important. This is a really important subject for you personally. I, I get to do a, a lot of pre-marriage counseling. I get to meet with couples as they prepare for marriage. And, and uh, when I first started 25 years ago, there was one week in the pre-marriage journey associated with finances. Now there's three. Money's a big deal in marriage. Money's a big deal for singles. How you handle and steward money says a lot about you. God says, show me your wallet or show me your online bank account, show me your Venmo, Zelle record, and I'll show you your heart. That's what Jesus says. Money is one of those things that are still, there's still some respect. I mean, just about everything else in our culture is up for grabs, right? I mean, ta everybody's talking about everything. I mean, even our health is no longer a secret anymore. But, but money, there's still some respect where we don't ask each other, hey, what do you make? We, we don't share. It's, there's, there's some privacy there still. But there's not privacy between you and God. And so here's an opportunity this morning for us to just take a few moments and talk about guard your steps when you come to the house of the Lord. This whole chapter is about worship. Worship in the sacrifice that we bring. Worship in, in our words. Worship in how we treat people. Worship in the things that we own. Money, mammon. Jesus says very clearly, you cannot serve mammon and the Lord. You, you can't. You, you can't be half-hearted in these two areas. And so you must choose, and, and I must choose, and where I'm going to invest. Really important throughout Scripture, uh, from the very beginning in Genesis 1, we're told God created the heavens and the earth. And day six, he created this incredible human race of people. When he created them, he made them in his image. No other creature was made in his image. Only mankind was made in his image. And from that point on, 
God says, I'm going to give you something to steward. I'm going to give you an opportunity to manage this garden. I'm going to own the garden, God says, but you're going to manage it and you're going to steward it. And from that point on, all of mankind has been given a sliver to manage and to steward. Throughout Scripture, we're never told that we own anything. I might think, we, and we use phrases and terminologies like, I own this car and I own this house. And no, you are stewarding it. You are a manager. Many of the parables that Jesus tells us are about the owner and the manager. And you have been given resources and time and talents to steward for a season. And the Bible tells us that that says a lot about who we are and what we think about our relationship with God. Everything that we think we own is really just on loan. Everything. So we have an opportunity as followers of Jesus to think biblically about money. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, well, 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, we're told, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves on earth treasures on earth, Oh, forgive us. We've all done it. We've all been guilty of it. I can't wait till I have this. Don't store up treasures for yourselves on earth, Jesus says, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves in heaven where moths and venom do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will also be. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or mammon. Jesus spoke more about money than any other subject. Why? Because he cares about us. He's given us really helpful biblical principles to honor God in this world. Money, money is not the means. Money does not give you meaning. There's no significant value. There's no difference in value of worth of a person based on their income. There's no. God does not view you in terms of how much money you make. We view each other differently based on that, right? And we all think, if I only earned more, if I got that job that paid this amount, then I'll be happy. If I got that bonus, if I got that tax rebate, then we'd be set for life. And many of us in the room, if we're honest, we're living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck, just barely getting by, waiting and hoping for something more. God says, uh, through Jesus, most important verse in that passage, I believe it's all important, Matthew 6, 33. What does it look like to trust God first in your finances? But seek ye first, it's King James, But seek ye first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Everything else. Put him first, everything else will fall into place. Trust God first financially. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So just you do business with God today. Who's going to be the master and the Lord of your life? What does it look like for you? to trust and honor God with your finances. Now listen, I want to address the tension in the room right now because I've been there. Early in ministry, we didn't have health insurance. First two churches I worked at didn't provide health insurance. Many, many of your jobs, it's not, it's not something that is offered and provided. And we had baby number one, and we had baby number two, and we had baby three. And I'm like, how in the world am I supposed to honor God with my finances when I've got to pay pay out of pocket for each, each of our child. We'd go to the hospital. We'd sit there, explain our situation. What can you do for us? Can we get a payment plan? I remember when our youngest 
we had her paid off. <laughs> it's like around her third birthday. We're like, Paige, you're ours now. We officially own you. We've paid it off. And I feel the tension in those moments where you're like, there's nothing left. How am I supposed to honor God? So a lot of us live, we live in this world of, of a one bucket world when it comes to our finances. Okay. In this bucket, it's, it's everything that I, I have to live on, to eat, to pay my bills, to take care of my kids, to buy diapers, to buy formula, to, right, to pay the water bill. We have one bucket, and everything goes in that one bucket. It's 100%. See, we all have 100%. Either the money is going to dictate to us how that's spent, or we get to decide. And so if up to this point in your life, you've not been deciding where every penny of your money and your wealth goes, then you get an opportunity to change that. And maybe this has been the, the true generations for generations in your family tree. You have an opportunity to change that. They say, from this point on, I'm going to tell my money where to go. And so we've just been living in one bucket. Everything I make goes to pay every expense that I have. But throughout Scripture, there's actually three buckets that we're told about. There's two other buckets I want to challenge you to think, think about. The second one here is save. Because tomorrow you may lose your job. Uh, my house may burn down. There are crises and there's emergencies, and we are told to be good stewards and managers. Remember, we're not owners. We are managing everything God's given for us for him. We're stewarding it. We're managing it for him. And so we are to save. We're to save a certain percentage. And this other bucket here is give. Now, typically what happens for if, if we have three buckets and we feel convicted to have three buckets, typically this is what ends up happening. I remember early in our marriage, I tried to do this. We tried to do this. So we're going to, we got to pay all our bills. I mean, God wants us to pay our bills, right? He, he got to pay the person what they're worth. And so we got to, got to cover all our expenses and all our bills. And then, then we'll put a little bit away. And you know what it, what ends up happening when we live this way? There's never anything left to give. Because I take care of me first, and I cover all my expenses. And then at the end of the day, I'll, I'll give God. I'll give God what I have left. This is why a $50 bill looks so big at church and so small at the mall, right? <laughs> Live, save, give. But what would it look like? What would it look like to honor God with our finances? Because ultimately, he's given you the skills and the ability to earn your income. That comes from God. What would it look like to honor him first? What would it look like as a follower of Jesus to, here's the order, to give first, save second, and then live on the rest? All in follower of Jesus, what would it look like to give 10%, save 20%, live on 70%? And you're like, oh my word, I am so far from that. Okay, what would it look like today to start, if you're at zero, to start with 1%? And if you're a guest with us today and you have your own local church, give to your own local church. This is, this is about what God wants for you, not from you. God doesn't need any of our money. God does not need your money. Jesus never once, according to Scripture, asked anybody for money. He asked for a coin to do a little magic trick. There is that story. But... But we believe he gave the coin back. <laughs> he never asked anybody for money. So God doesn't need your money. This is not a needs your money sermon. This is what God wants for you. He wants you to be in a position where you recognize God first, not last. And if we're honest, we look at our budget. Where's God in our budget? What does it look like to honor God, to give first, save second, and then live, to live on the rest? Jesus tells a lot of different parables about managing 
our money. Ephesians 3.16, what's really interesting in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the patriarchs, the Abrahams, the Jacobs, the Josephs, they were, they were told and promised land and riches. That was part of the promises of God that we're going to give you land and we're, you're, going to, you're going to be wealthy and you're going to be rich and you're going to have cattle. But in the New Testament, never is the church promised riches of this world. The riches that we are promised I pray, Paul writes, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The greatest verse in the New Testament, believers, concerning riches, Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Jesus. When I give first, I'm saying, God, I'm trusting you with the rest. I don't know how this, I don't know what bills are going to come up this week. I don't know, I don't know. But God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to honor you. And so, I would encourage you to do what, do what God's asking you to do. And I listen, I know there's tension. I know the feeling that you're wrestling with. I would encourage all of us to take a step. If it's 0% right now, what would it look like to give 1%? Just to begin to do that. If you don't have a savings account, what would it look like to start 1% into savings? And then to take the rest. Because so often, what, I mean, there are books being written right now in our culture, how to get by on 100 grand. Because we, the average American is spending more than they're receiving. So they're not even thinking saving and giving, right? They're spending, what would it look like to put a governor on our expenses, right? As our income goes up, it just frees us up. Because money, money will not give you meaning, but money is a means to an end. And what is that end? To invest in eternity. It's to invest in eternity. One day, one day there's going to be a gathering of people to talk about you at the end of your life after you've passed away. And I've done many, many, many services. You know what they never talk about? People's stuff. Never Oh, I'm up here. I just want to testify to all the stuff this guy has in his garage. Hey, I went to his shed. Let me tell you all the stuff I found in his shed. Nobody's talking about stuff, but they are telling stories. And you have an opportunity to have, have what story is going to be told about your life by how you steward and how you manage. It's an incredible privilege that God gives each and every one of us. It is, it is not about how much. It's about what are you doing with what he has given you. And, th and there's, there's a whole sermon series we could spend on this. We're not. Don't worry, next week we're not, we're not still on the subject next week. But Jesus says, those who are faithful with a little, guess what the, the owner is going to do? Some of you, you, you run companies. What do you do with really faithful employees who manage and steward things really, really well? You give them more. That is biblical. If you're faithful with a little. When our girls were in high school, I paid for all of them to go through Financial Peace University. It's Dave Ramsey's nine-week course. I encourage everybody to go through it. In the fall, here at Boulder Mountain, we're going to offer financial stewardship. Be helpful for all of us. You'll hear more information on that. I paid my daughters to go. So I'll give you $100 cash if you go for nine weeks. Every week you miss, I take 10. You miss three, it's done and over with. Because it's so important. I want them to understand the basics of biblical stewardship. That everything you have is being, is, it's on loan. And we have an opportunity to steward this well. So let me ask you the question. What does it look like for you to honor God with your finances? I'm not giving you a formula today. That's between you and God. You get to have that conversation with God. But here's what I'd encourage you to do. Give until it hurts. Right? If I give and I don't feel it, am I, am I coming all in on worship? There's different ways that uh, my wife and I give here at Boulder Mountain um, I remember my dad, and not all of us had the opportunity to grow up in a Christian home, but I remember my dad, at the, I was having cereal at the breakfast table, and uh, there were seven of us kids, so you had to get there early. 
but he would pull out his checkbook and uh, he'd write his check on Sunday morning. He'd sit there at the table. A couple hours before service, he'd write his check. Back then, they had giving envelopes, and every family in the church had a little number, right? And so he'd put it in there. And then he had a dress shirt, and he'd put that envelope in his dress shirt pocket. He'd put it in there for a couple hours, and then when the plate was passed, back in the day, I would watch him. He'd, he'd pull it out, and that was, that was worship. That was his way of saying, I'm honoring God with everything that I have. First is I have because God gave it to me. So I had the privilege of, of watching that. Now you can sit at your computer one-on-one. -on -one. You can, you know, set it up. But whatever you choose to do, may that be a form of worship. And if, let me just say this. If you're like, hey, I don't know Boulder Mountain yet. I don't trust Boulder Mountain. Again, give it to another church, a gospel-preaching, Bible-believing church. This is not about what we want or need. This is about what God wants for you. He, he loves you. And he so desires for you to not, not be worrying about this. It brings so much freedom when we recognize what we have is just on loan. Give first. Save second. And whatever's left, that's what you live on. What would it look like to do that? Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, I pray. I know this is, a, this is a topic your son talked a whole lot about when he was on earth. And it creates a lot of different feelings in the room. And um, God, I pray for grace. First, I, I pray thank you for everything we do have. Thank you, God, for, um, for what you were able to provide for us this week. Every bill that was paid corporately in this room, we recognize was a gift from you. Thank you. Everything comes from you. Our income comes from you. Our ability to earn income comes from you. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would challenge us all, encourage us all to take a step in any of these areas, that we would take a step, and that our giving would be an opportunity to worship you. For at the end of the day, we recognize wealth will not fulfill us. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.